think we are uh, ready to start. So the next talk, as you can see, is uh, is online, uh, but uh, the speaker uh, is happy to answer questions during the talk. So I'll uh, give you the microphone, otherwise he'll, he'll not be able to hear. Um, and uh, so the next speaker is uh, Daniel Segre from Boston University, and uh, couldn't be here with us, but also kind to give the talk online. And he's going to talk about uh, uh, metabolism in ancient time and space. So thanks a lot, Daniel, to be with us. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. OK, good. Um, sorry for not being there in person, first of all. Uh, I really was looking forward to that. And this happened. And, uh, um, I, uh, but um, I am happy to have a chance to talk to you remotely. And as uh, Jacopo was saying, I'm happy to, if you interrupt me and ask questions uh, along the way. Um, so I, I, as you may see, I modified the title a bit relative to the original title I, I gave because I wanted to try and cover some of the topics I was supposed to be to cover in, in person by connecting a little bit different dots and trying to draw connections uh, that are hopefully new and uh, non-trivial uh, between different topics. And in particular, talking about ancient metabolism and uh, modern microbial ecosystem metabolism. In the lab right now, we work mostly on microbial communities in uh, uh, soil and in the ocean. Uh, we work a lot on synthetic communities. Uh, we're involved in human microbiome and uh, insect gut microbes. Uh, but I'm not going to start... Um, as hinted by the title from the ancient past. And um, and I want to make this point that somehow uh, we I like to think of metabolism as memory in the origin of life. So I'm going to dive straight back to 3.8 or so billion years ago uh, and think about the meaning of metabolism back then and what we understand about the history of metabolism. I know some of you may have done research or interested in this topic, I'll try to summarize some, some concepts. Um, so the first concept I'm going to talk about is uh, that one can think of, mem uh, of metabolism as heredity. Um, and in fact, one of the challenges in Origin of Life is to understand how uh, inheritance and Darwinian evolution could emerge. And um, I'm going to claim that metabolism can serve uh, that role of connection. And the other is to look at metabolism as a historical record and see whether we can understand the history of metabolism by looking at networks today and think of networks as fossils. So let me start with this uh, first part. And um, a lot of this dates back to uh, work that I did uh, during my PhD many years ago. And, um, and this somehow summarizes a little bit this dichotomy of possible views. And there are, of course, a lot of um, um, ways of viewing ancient history of life in between. But I want to just point out this very basic concept that somehow um, uh, we still have uh, and often represented in textbook, uh, biochemistry textbooks, this, this idea that somehow life should start from a self-replicating single molecule uh, and that RNA uh, might have served that role early on because of this, of its amazing catalytic roles and obviously information storage roles uh, and that cells as we know them today may have come from this early self-replicating polymers that could have gradually uh, assembled the rest of um, the cellular components. And one of the tr problems with this view is that it's very challenging to imagine how a self-replicating molecules could arise, but there is interesting research in this direction. And then there is this alternative view and somehow if you trace back life as we know it today to the early stages, one can think that somehow life today is not, you know, it is, there is a single replicating molecule inside that is DNA, but it's really not uh, about single self-replicating molecules. It's about a collection of molecules that collectively uh, self-reproduce. And perhaps the idea is that this was never about a single molecule reproducing, but it has always been about a collection of molecules uh, mutually catalytic with each other, catalyzing each other's synthesis, and collectively acting as a self-replicating unit. Um, I actually, I quoted this uh, Freeman Dyson, who called this idea the garbage bag world, 
uh, with the idea that somehow there is no specific molecule early on uh, and it really it was about this mixture of chemicals that collectively could uh, self-reproduce. And one of the things I want to point out, there is a lot of aspects to this, but one thing I want to focus on is how one can think of inheritance in this early stages of life. And there, uh, the simple way of uh, explaining this is somehow, oops, sorry, if you imagine um, self aggregating molecule like uh, antiphiles or uh, lipid molecules or even a crystal, you could think of growth as a process where an ensemble of molecules could grow and then split. And this is a form of inheritance. So this would be, uh, though, a very trivial form of inheritance because there, if there is homogeneity in the composition of this ensemble, of course, there is a form of self-reproduction, but it's trivial. Um, at the opposite extreme of the spectrum, if you imagine extreme complexity of the molecular components, um, you could imagine something like a random walk in the space of compositions and an ensemble of molecules in an early milieu on prebiotic Earth, giving rise to um, ensembles that will potentially uh, grow due to self-assembly or other processes and occasionally break because of physical forces. Uh, but if there is too much diversity or there is no mechanism for maintenance of composition, this would be a random walk again in the space of compositions and it would be nothing like uh, what we see today in modern cells. Um, and the idea that we had proposed back then, based on a lot of work done before by dating back from Oparin and Harold Morowitz, Stuart Kaufman, Freeman Dyson and others, um, was that somehow if the um, um, forces and the uh, mechanism and the processes determining how an ensemble of molecules could grow and divide uh, has certain specific properties, then there is a chance to have a composition of molecules that will grow and then split and um, give rise to a uh, progeny that is similar enough to the original ensemble so that you can have what we call compositional inheritance or a compositional genome or short composome that is somehow a potential early version of uh, memory and inheritance based on which you could jumpstart uh, an evolutionary process. Now, just I'm, I'm skipping a lot of details on this and just to give an idea of how such a process could arise, you could imagine uh, e either um, chemical reactions giving rise to... Um, um, different molecules in this or original uh, pr primordial ensemble, but even just uh, joining of existing uh, molecules such as uh, lipid or self-aggregating molecules. And all you need really is a, um, a set of molecules that selects which other molecule will grow. And this can be viewed as a, a trajectory in the space of compositions. Um, in fact, we call this uh, as one of the possible embodiments, the lipid world, because this was based on the idea of self uh, spontaneous aggregation, but the general concept of um, the trajectory in the space of composition, composition giving rise to, rise to an attractor uh, that looks like this self replicating process is much more general. Um, and I think actually it's nicely explained in a much more recent review from Doron Lancet, in uh, whose lab at the Weizmann Institute in Israel I did this work early on. Um, they published recently this article showing in more detail how one can think of this compositional inheritance as emerging as an attractor in uh, the trajectory in the space of composition. So uh, in my mind, when I think now of early life and metabolism, I really visualize something like this, where um, there are complex chemical processes and you can ask about the uh, rise of um, something like an eigenvector in the space of compositions that is uh, maintained uh, despite uh, noise. And there is beautiful work. I don't know if Sanjay is there. He's done beautiful work in this area as well. Now, one of the reasons I'm telling you this, uh, uh, and I'm, again, skipping a lot of the details, is that somehow this is not so dissimilar from what we do when we think of flux balance analysis and modern cellular metabolism. Um, this is actually the uh, molecular composition, the biomass composition of an E. coli cell, 
you see the proportion of different amino acids, phospholipids, nucleotides, and cofactors. And this is, in fact, uh, exactly the numbers that we use when we make um, flux balance model of a cell, right? So I'm, I think you've heard uh, in the past few days about flux balance modeling, so I'm not going to go into any more detail, but just want to remind you that you have the whole stoichiometry of the metabolic network, uh, sources of the different elements coming in, and then ultimately you ask how can a cell produce the precise composition of the molecules needed to produce the amino acids, nucleotides, lipids, and so on that compose biomass of the cell. And essentially, this is very similar to this idea of composome. It is a self-reproducing uh, composition of molecules. Um, let me pause here, just uh, see if there is any question. I want to try to make this as interactive as possible. So please interrupt, or I, I'll pause occasionally to see if there are questions. Any question? Seems there are no questions for now. Okay, okay, okay. So I'll keep going. And um, I will then um, jump to another way of thinking of metabolism as uh, memory and tell a little bit about work we've done more recently about um, how to look at the historical record of life by looking at uh, metabolism as a network fossil. Um, so obviously we can look, think of fossils of life in terms of rocks and uh, real fossils in rocks. Um, and it's very natural now to look at uh, genomic sequences as fossils of, of life where we can read about the history of life. Uh, but I think it's less usual and less natural, but still actually very interesting. And, and I think more and more um, um, increasingly explored the idea of looking at networks as fossils of ancient life. So this is the structure of all known metabolic networks, uh, metabolic reactions across different organisms from, um, it's a representation of a collection of all metabolic reactions. You can see here the TCA cycle and glycolysis, but it's obviously very complex. And one of the questions is, what does this network tell us about the ancient history of metabolism, potentially dating back to a time before the emergence of um, genomes and transcription translation and so on. And how do you even do this? How do you interrogate this network to try and understand the ancient history of metabolism? And one way of doing this um, was suggested by Oliver Ebenhall and uh, Reinhard Heinrich uh, several years ago in a series of beautiful, beautiful papers starting with this genome informatics paper in 20, 20, 2004 um, where they proposed what they call the network expansion algorithm. Um, I don't know if some of you may be familiar with this. I'll tell you with this super simple example how this works, and you'll see in a second why this is powerful for interrogating also complex networks. So the idea is the following. Imagine this is the equivalent of this very large metabolism I, I showed you. Uh, so this is the collection of all known metabolic reactions. At scale, this is just two reactions. So you can ask the following question. You can ask if uh, uh, some set of molecules are initially present, for example, in an early environment, and we call this the seed molecules. Imagine these are these two molecules. You can ask what reactions are possible. Um, and you, you don't even ask questions about enzymes that catalyze these reactions. You just ask whether uh, in terms of the presence of individual molecules, what reactions are potentially feasible in this uh, in, in this world? So if these two molecules are present, this bimolecular reaction that can take place. So you'll add these two products um, as an additional set of uh, molecules in your network, and that's where it ends. There are no more reactions possible. Uh, this is called the scope of the network, and this this uh, set of four molecules now is the collection of all possible metabolites that are feasible under these initial conditions. And you can change, of course, the initial condition and ask, for example, if this molecule is also part of the seed set. And in this case, in addition to these two molecules, now that this molecule is feasible and this is initially present, this reaction can fire, giving rise to these two molecules. So in this case, now all possible uh, molecules are feasible and the scope corresponds to the whole network. And now you can imagine asking similar questions based on the collection of all metabolic networks. 
And what is nice about this is that this is equivalent to asking questions uh, about ecosystem level metabolism, because now we're asking, we can ask questions about how a seed of metabolites present in this, um, you know, somewhere uh, in, in this initial network, uh, what other portions of metabolism can they reach? And you can change the set of initial molecules and explore what portions of metabolism are feasible based on those initial molecules. And one thing that is interesting, again, is that we're by exploring and walking along this network, um, you're exploring not the metabolism of an individual organism, but the collective metabolism of the biosphere uh, and what is the potential given this initial molecular set. Does that make sense? Does, yes. Okay. Uh, there okay. is a question. So, Hi, so I was wondering if the seed and scope, I guess, looking at it from a more history dependent matter, this also depends on the conditions that the organisms are in, right? So how do you deal with that? So kind of what, what reactions are possible don't only depend on the seeds, but also the environmental conditions, for example, that this whole network is embedded in, and this could change over time. Or do I understand something wrong here? No, no, this is this is a perfect and beautiful question, and you understand exactly. And um, I'll show you in a little bit. In um, early work we did on this, we did not address this environmental dependence question, except for the choice of the metabolites themselves. Um, but um, and let, I'll, I'll just mention this now. So one can do this network expansion this very, very simple way, just by asking, you know, walking on the topology of the reaction network. But you can add additional information. And in particular, you can ask about thermodynamic feasibility. And that's one way of embedding important um, thermodynamic infor uh, environmental information. Because when you introduce the thermodynamics, you can ask, given this metabolites and uh, assuming certain um, ranges of possible concentrations. And if we know the delta G for this reaction and take into account then the temperature and pH dependent on that reaction, you can ask not just whether that reaction is feasible in terms of the topology, but also whether it's reasonably true that the, that reaction could occur spontaneously under uh, those conditions. So you can add at least pH and temperature as environmental variables. Of course, there is a limit to how much we can do with this, um, but um, this is hopefully addressing at least partially your question. And I'll show you some examples of, of this. Um, any other question? Uh, I think no, so we move okay. on. So uh, I'll show you first a result we obtained using this method uh, several years ago, this was work done um, really by Jason Raymond. Um, he asked a question about the dependence of metabolism on the rise of oxygen in the atmosphere during the great oxidation event that happened about 2.2 billion years ago. And that's when um, cyanobacteria started uh, accumulating oxygen in atmosphere changing completely the fate of life and probably inducing uh, the rise of multicellular organisms. So it was a very interesting question. And we had the opportunity to ask the following question using this network expansion algorithm. And the idea there was to start with a seed set that did not include oxygen and compare it with a seed set that did include oxygen. So you can look at the possible changes in global metabolism induced by the uh, presence of oxygen. And what we found was that when you make this transition from an anoxic to an oxic global metabolism, there is a several hundreds of reactions and hundreds of metabolites that are added. Uh, so in blue, this is the structure of the anoxic network, and the red portions are the uh, branches that were added uh, due to the uh, presence of oxygen. And what is interesting here is that oxygen here um, was essentially used as a... Um, a molecular uh, compound for uh, for um, biosynthetic processes, not necessarily just as a um, um, electron acceptor, as we obviously know uh, today. 
But a lot of these branches are branches, for example, sterol biosynthesis, the terpenoid bio biosynthesis. These are all uh, complex molecules uh, that require molecular oxygen uh, for biosynthesis. And there are alternative um, non-oxygen dependent pathways for some of these molecules, but there are several uh, new branches that are actually associated with uh, complex eukaryotic organisms. So this is one first possible application of this network expansion algorithm to ask questions that would be otherwise very difficult to ask. Um, and more recently, uh, we, uh, in a particular Josh Goldford, the former student in my lab, thought of asking uh, a question that would address really something going further back into the history of life and addressing what is uh, known as the phosphate problem. Uh, so phosphate, which is obviously ubiquitous in uh, present-day living systems, um, is usually, other than in biotic process, locked in uh, rocks, such as apatites are shown here. And it's also uh, a very major, a major um, trigger of uh, uh, blooms. If you, so it's often a limiting nutrients in, in uh, metabolic processes and natural ecosystem. But it's 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 been very hard to understand how um, phosphate could uh, become part of life early on uh, because of this poor bioavailability. And Josh thought of doing the following: taking a plausible set of molecules present, uh, thought to be present on early Earth, uh, and leaving out phosphate. And I assume many of you are familiar with how metabolism looks today. Uh, if you look at reactions in metabolism, for example, in E. coli, there is tons of reactions that, of course, uh, include ATP and ADP, phosphate-containing molecules that uh, where phosphate uh, bonds carry energy that is enabling several reactions to occur. And in fact, uh, our first thought was that if we were to do this network expansion in um, metabolism, uh, in this global metabolism, without in, uh, including any source of phosphate, uh, there would barely be any connected pieces of metabolism. I, I imagine in my mind really just a lot of bits and pieces, but no feasible network based on um, this metabolism. So notice that there is uh, there are sources of, of sulfur here, uh, uh, what are called thioesters, sulfur-containing compounds um, that were hypothesized before to be potential energy carriers prior to the uh, emergence of phosphate. So... Uh, what we found was quite surprising, and I'll show you, jump straight to the result uh, that uh, Josh found. And essentially what emerged from this early compound was a network of uh, 260 metabolites, 315 reactions, uh, all connected. Uh, you can see here in blue the initial seed. So this is where kind of this network expansion starts, uh, and it expands to several molecules that include a lot of um, the known uh, central carbon metabolism intermediates, such as pyruvate, and include a lot of amino acid. And um, what was somehow surprising, I mean, first of all, is that there is such a network at all, that there is a, uh, whether or not one, um, you know, and I think one should be skeptical about how uh, relevant or how, whether this is telling us something uh, true about the early stages of metabolism, but it is, uh, it was surprising, it is surprising, and it is um, true that, that such a subnetwork exists in metabolism today. So somehow the fact itself that there is a strong connected component subnetwork of uh, uh, reactions that do not involve phosphate in metabolism today is in itself quite stunning. Um, you can actually look at the enzyme that catalyzed these reactions today uh, in an attempt to really try and connect this to early life. And the idea here was to try and ask the following question. If you look at uh, the enzyme that catalyzed this reaction today, and remember that in doing this network expansion, we didn't ask anything about enzyme. We just were, we were just looking at the topology of metabolism, but now we have a network and we can look at the enzyme that catalyzed this reaction in living systems today and ask the following question. Is there any sign uh, that the enzyme that catalyzes these reactions today uh, have an ancient origin. And what Josh thought of doing is asking the following question. Do we see an enrichment in these enzymes today 
for enzymes that have as their core uh, cofactors iron sulfur clusters, which are thought uh, to be uh, some of the earliest minerals uh, catalyzing reaction. And um, what we mm -hmm. found shown here is that this core network is strongly enriched relative to the full network um, with and without presence of oxygen. Good. So irrespective of, um, of the um, oxygen level in the atmosphere, when there is a strong enrichment for protein that contain both iron sulfur cluster as well as uh, zinc. So this is consistent with these ideas um, explored by um, several other researchers today and proposed before by others that um, iron, sulfur, iron sulfur cluster these um, minerals were some of the early catalysts and then could be incorporated in modern enzymes and catalyzed uh, reaction this early, um, early network. There is a, a question. Oh, yes. Sorry, I, I have a, I don't understand if I missed this or my question is the network that you were showing earlier. So the one, the network that you find, yes, exactly this one. Uh, can it synthesize all 20 known amino acids? Like technically could an organism use just this network to make all 20 amino acids? Ignoring of course the fact that this does not involve the phosphate. So there is no energy, there is no ATP. Does right. my question make Excellent sense? Excellent question. Yeah, 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 no, that the question makes perfect sense. Actually, I don't remember exactly. I don't think all of the amino acids can be synthesized. Um, I think two thirds or so of the amino acids can be synthesized. And um, and I also want to highlight that it's true that this is, so this does not contain phosphate. I should say um, this means that really there are reactions in metabolism today that are independent of phosphate. And so this could not have been driven by phosphate, but the hypothesis that could have been driven by this thioester. So it could be still potentially energetically feasible uh, with the thioester, the sulfur containing compounds playing uh, the initial role of energy carriers prior to the emergence of phosphate. Um, but this would be obviously an early metabolism, an incomplete metabolism. Notice also there is something else that is interesting here is that because nucleotides contain phosphate, this early putative phosphate independent network could not produce nucleotides. So this would be, uh, uh, you know, could be producing amino acids and several other molecules, including some po other polymers, but um, would require the rise of phosphate in order to uh, add nucleotides and, and DNA and RNA. But that, that's an excellent question. Any other question? Okay, I think we can uh, move on. Okay, so um, um, someone was, was asking earlier about energetic constraints, um, and I'm gonna not gonna go into full details, but uh, there is a follow-up uh, paper that was published in 2019 um, where we incorporated this um, uh, thermodynamic constraints, um, and this was done. Um, using the equilibrator. Uh, I don't know if, uh, yeah, some of the equilibrator uh, developers might be there. And um, the, um, the idea was that one could take into account in order to know whether specific reaction were uh, feasible, um, one could add constraints and decide that only reactions that could get above the thermodynamic constraints would be feasible. And now through the equilibrator, we could calculate the pH and temperature dependence of those uh, thermodynamic constraints and have a network that would incorporate some of the environmental information. And one of the things that we found in this context was that there was a um, reduced core network. Um, uh, and what is interesting, and I, again, that would require a lot of uh, time to go into, but I just want to point out that this reminds a little bit of the TCA cycle, and in fact, it in includes a lot of the reactions of the TCA cycle, but also involves other thioester um, uh, dependent reactions. So this is a little bit of a mosaic of reactions that are not known to exist in any specific individual organism today, 
uh, but are taken from different organisms and could have been a putative uh, central carbon metabolism uh, early on. And this is consistent with uh, thermodynamic constraints for a broad set of uh, pH and temperatures. And I invite you to look at this if you want to learn more about this. Um, one thing that now connects us back to flux balance modeling is that once you have networks like this, you can also try to make a flux balance model of a, of a protocell. Uh, and that's what, what we did here. Um, and again, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but you can essentially take these reactions that I showed before, think of what a putative early biomass might have looked like. And again, there were no nucleotides, so no DNA, RNA, and still no proteins really. Um, but there could have been um, other polymers um, and lipids that were feasible under those conditions. And this is very, uh, very um, uh, speculative models of a protocell. But the point we wanted to make here is that there is this connection between methods that we use for modeling cellular metabolism today and the way we think about ancient networks and there are connected and it actually can be very useful to apply the systems biology approaches such as like flux balance analysis to study the feasibility um, and the consistency of um, networks uh, of early life. Um, the other thing that I'll point out before jumping back to the present day modeling of, of communities is that one can explore other types of questions using um, flux balance models and uh, ask questions about early life. And I wanna point you to this uh, paper published recently also uh, uh, spearheaded by Josh Goldford that um, shows how one can ask questions about the uh, emergence of cofactors and redox uh, cofactors in particular. And the idea was the following. In metabolism today, in addition to ATP, ATP mentioned before, that are the energy carriers, there is a strong dependence of these electron carriers, NAD and NADP. So these are the molecules that allow electrons to uh, move from molecule to molecule and are essential in metabolism today. And one of the things that is not clear, even if, again, it's explained in textbook uh, biochemistry textbooks as just being related to um, uh, um, biosynthetic metabolism or anabolism and catabolism, the, the degradation of molecules. Typically, NADP is associated with anabolism, NAD with catabolism. But it's not, if you look at where these cofactors appear, it's not very clear that there is a universal association with anabolism and catabolism, especially given that fluxes can change based on conditions and so on. So we asked the following question, why are there two cofactors? Why isn't one enough? Or is one potentially enough? So one can do the following exercise using flux balance models. You can take the whole network of reactions and substitute arbitrarily. Uh, for example, you can do different exercises, which are all illustrated in this paper. You can randomly switch some cofactors and switch NADP to NAD and see what happens. Or you can try and ask what happens if you had just one cofactor and switch all the NADP to NAD. So you'd have a network that is um, stoichiometrically very well defined and seems feasible. And in fact, if you switch all NADP to NAD and you have a single cofactor in the network, stoichiometrically, this seems completely feasible. So you can run flux balance models, you will get biomass, uh, and everything seems fine. And what is even more surprising, even if you introduce the known thermodynamic constraints, um, it seems feasible that uh, an E. coli cell could potentially survive and grow just with one cofactor. Uh, so this is very surprising. And this is a uh, potentially testable hypothesis. I think it would be very challenging to build an E. coli cell where all the NADPH um, are substituted by NAD. But if those were possible at some point, uh, our prediction was, was is that it would be possible to have a single cofactor dependent E. coli. So then the question um, was why, when then would we have uh, two cofactors in present day cells? And the answer uh, suggested by a mathematical model developed by Josh is that uh, this has to do with the cost of protein production and that somehow by having two cofactors one can enable more efficiently 
uh, running reactions in both directions of donating and receiving electrons uh, in a much more efficient way. Uh, but this has to do with the cost of protein production, not with uh, the fundamental uh, infeasibility of, uh, of uh, uh, having a single cofactor. So this has to do with the proteome allocation and optimality of proteome um, allocation by having two cofactors that can simultaneously be present and available to run reactions uh, in both directions. And I will switch gears now to go uh, dive back into modern metabolism. Um, and one of the links and I want to make here is that somehow um, I like to think of metabolism a really multi-scale process. So we've already seen this, right? Because uh, the networks were illustrated went from individual enzymes and individual reactions to really trying to make this very ambitious uh, estimates of global planetary biochemistry in, in the past. And I think it's actually, you know, whether or not we know how to do this now, I, I think it's really fascinating to think that metabolism, unlike I think any other metabolic process is truly multi-scale because you can think of enzymes, cells uh, are, are all catalysts of metabolic flow. And you can talk about the same molecules that are involved in single enzyme reactions and whole cells and ecosystem and the planetary scale. Um, so there is some really continuity and buildup, which I think is an exciting challenge uh, for all of us to think about how do we bridge these scales uh, with, with models of metabolism. But I want to go a little bit back to you know when we started thinking about these questions of ecosystem level metabolism. And this for us started in uh, uh, before 2010, around that time, um, motivated by, by some early work done by um, Winian Shu and others that had um, designed and constructed these um, synthetic communities, some of the, I think the earliest synthetic communities. This was an example with two yeast cells that were um, oxytrophic for lysine and adenine respectively. So one of these uh, yeast was engineered not to be able to produce lysine, the other not to produce adenine, but together they could coexist and, and survive and grow uh, because of the exchange of these two molecules. And this was because essentially they were tweaking of the internal circuits of the cells. Uh, one of the things we started thinking about, and uh, Niels Klipkor, the former student in the lab, is whether we could do something similar and started exploring this with uh, flux balance modeling, but uh, modifying the question a little bit. Uh, so instead of tweaking the internal circuits, we wanted to tweak the environment and ask the following question, can we design an environment and choose a nitrogen carbon source and so on, so that given to uh, microbes, to bacteria, for example, uh, we could induce an obligate interaction between these two bacteria. So now we would like to ask whether it's possible to induce interactions without tweaking the internal circuits of the cells, but just by modifying the environment. And what we found back then using flux panels models is that for several organisms, there were, there were in fact millions of possible solutions, millions of possible combinations of carbon nitrogen sources and so on that should um, induce obligate uh, mutualistic interaction between organisms. And this, if this was true, that, that would mean that there are a lot of possibilities for interactions between uh, different bacteria in, in microbial communities. And these interactions could be mediated by the exchange of essential metabolites, and also that these interactions would be strongly dependent on the environment. So this, this was really the early work that uh, drove us to start thinking a lot more about metabolism in communities and whether we can model metabolism in communities. And ultimately also, as we do now in the lab, try to build experimentally synthetic communities and explore how these communities depend on the environmental condition. Um, so there are different aspects to this, which we explore in detail, uh, the exchange of metabolites, how um, in, in the structure of environment modifies interactions and also how environmental complexity affects interaction between species. I'm not gonna cover all of these topics. I'll tell you a little bit in particular about space and time. Um, and I'll illustrate this by describing a method that I don't know if it may have been brought up before in the past few days, but if not, I'll just summarize quickly. This is an approach called dynamic flux balance analysis, and it's a 
uh, modification of uh, the basic concept of flux balance analysis. Um, in fact, the original paper that suggested this was published in 2002 by Mahadevan and colleagues. And I think it's a beautiful paper that kind of was, was uh, sitting there for a long time, I think before people started realizing the relevance for ecosystem level metabolism. And in fact, that paper introduces two different kinds of dynamic flux balance analysis. What, one that is based on the global optimization of a whole trajectory. I'm not gonna go into that. I'll describe the simplest version, which has to do with just uh, taking individual steps and discretizing time. And by discretizing time, you can imagine taking for an individual time step, solving a flux balance problem for an individual organism where you have, again, its own metabolism, the biomass that represents growth and so on. And when you solve the flux balance problem for this individual organism, what you find is the slope of this initial portion of the growth curve. Um, and now you make an assumption about the size of delta T. And uh, what happens then is that you start with an initial biomass composition, a uh, biomass amount for this organism. You also start from an initial amount of the nutrient and you have to translate the nutrient abundance into a flux by using a kinetic term like a michaelis menten equation. So this ends up being some kind of hybrid model where the concentration of metabolites is translated into a flux. But what you get back then is that uh, the concentration of the metabolites will change in time because again, you have the flux of consumption of this metabolite. So you update this. And now at this next time point, you have a modified abundance of the, of the nutrients. I modified biomass. You can iterate again flux balance and ultimately you'll obtain this piecewise linear approximation of the growth curve and also a prediction of how the environment changes uh, due to growth of this organism. Now, what is nice about this, it has, you know, people have used this to model dioxic shift and there's a lot of uh, research in this area. Uh, what, what we were curious to do was to see how we could use this to model communities in particular, because imagine this organism, for example, using glucose could secrete acetate, the acid is start accumulating in the environment. And now there could be a second organism that might not have been able to grow on the original glucose, but could grow on this acetate. And now uh, this organism can grow because of the presence of this first organism. So what you observe in this case is that there is an emergent interaction between the green and the yellow organism mediated by the exchange of this acetate molecule. And what is cool is that um, this was a consequence of each organism doing as in traditional flux balance analysis, maximizing its own biomass. So there is no uh, assumption of an ecosystem level objective. And it's an interesting question in itself, whether and how to potentially look for such things. But here there is still just individual organisms objective. Each organism is trying to do what is best for itself. And still this will give rise to this exchange uh, and interaction. So we embedded this right there. I mean, we decided that we wanted to incorporate the spatial component in this. So we uh, embedded this whole thing in a spatial grid where in addition to this dynamic flux balance processes, there could be diffusion between neighboring regions. Uh, we started doing this in 2D. Now uh, this uh, idea is also expanded to three dimensions. Uh, this was pioneered by Bill Real and Will Harcom was working in Chris Marx's lab at the time. Um, and now is um, carried on by Ilya Dukowski in my lab and others. And um, let's see how am I doing with time? I wanna leave time for question, but I'll, I'll just tell you a bit more about this uh, system called Comets, a computational microbial ecosystem in time and space. And um, this was tested experimentally early on on some simple communities. And I'm gonna skip the details here, but just so that you know, this were uh, artificially constructed synthetic communities of two or three organisms. This was devised or devised by Will Harcom early on, and then uh, Chris Marks and, and Will. Um, and these are very elegant and interesting systems in themselves, experimental systems. And what was nice that uh, was that by after um, in fitting just a few parameters for individual organs, as you know, flux balance doesn't have many parameters, but we and we took some of the kinetic parameters from the literature, um, the uh, comets would predict quite accurately the uh, final abundance 
uh, of the two species and also in the three species community, comets did a, a pretty good job. So this is some early uh, results. Um, one thing I wanna point out also is that some of these secretions in these systems are spontaneous, such as E. coli secreting acetate. Others in this case were evolved, um, imposed through uh, evolutionary adaptation. And this is something that we're still very interested in. I think it's still, still largely an open question. Um, how much of these uh, uh, mediated uh, interactions mediated by metabolic exchange, even in communities today, how many of these are spontaneous or what we also call now costless uh, secretions that are just the outcome of cells using whatever resources are available and as an outcome of that uh, uh, secreting molecules that are useless from their perspective, but that can be used as useful resources by other organisms. And how much of these are evolved a costly uh, production um, that, that can be also mediating uh, interaction. So I think there is this really interesting question, how many of these interactions are evolved and costly and how many are costless? I think this is still an open question. Uh, there is evidence from work done uh, in the San Sanchez lab um, that a lot of these interactions are, are somehow um, due to individual organisms secreting uh, stuff spontaneously and that stuff uh, can help other organisms grow. So I think there is probably a lot of this costless exchange out there. Um, but I want to go back to comments just to illustrate it was uh, really exciting for us that a number of people, including um, Alvaro and uh, Will Harcom and their lab, they started using comets for different applications. And rather than, you know, they could, they start adding different modules to comets. So this is an, kind of an exercise in collaborative software writing. Uh, so rather than uh, developing different subversions, we try to uh, bring together all these different new components and we work, they work. I didn't do really much uh, except overseeing this, but there was a lot of uh, coding and a lot of exchange uh, for a few years to bring this together. And this gave, gave rise to a new version of comets, um, which we described in this Nature Protocols paper a couple of years ago. Um, and I just want to highlight that comets is written in Java. So it's, uh, you know, it's not a straightforward software to use, but um, now uh, we have a Python toolbox and a MATLAB toolbox. I think the Python toolbox is particularly good and still under constant revision and development. So one can write macro uh, functions to define different environments, uh, create a Petri dish, for example, with different media, continuous culture, batch culture, and add different um, organisms from standard Cobra toolbox and run simulations generating growth curves uh, and evolutionary dynamics. And there are a lot of other features that are available. And this is still work in progress. Uh, comments is available at this website, is, is free and open source. So anybody interested is welcome to contribute or ask questions, uh, try to use it and, and give us feedback. Um, we, you know, some of the aspects that are still kind of under development and we have some preliminary work on this, but. Uh, just to show you possible expansion of comets in new directions. One is the addition of extracellular enzymes, which are difficult to model using traditional flux balance analysis. But now you can model extracellular enzymes as a metabolite. So in, if you have amino acids producing biomass in a certain proportion, you can assume that some of them will produce um, uh, an extracellular enzyme, for example, a cellulase that is being secreted. And once it's secreted, it's treated as if it was a metabolite, except that it can carry reactions. So you can model uh, michaelis menten kinetics in the extracellular environments. And now, for example, cellulose can be degraded, giving rise to glucose that can be imported in the cell. And you can ask questions such as, you know, does the cell have an optimal allocation of the amino acids? How much should go into biomass? How much should go into producing the cellulo cellulase in order to maximize growth? And you can imagine that if you produce too much of the uh, enzyme, you have no biomass left, but if you produce too much of the biomass, then you, will not, you won't have enough cellulose to cut the cellulose that is giving rise to the only source of carbon. So we predict that there is this optimal uh, rate of uh, allocation of the amino acids to the, to the enzyme. And this depends on the amount of initial um, cellulose present in the cell. Um, this is uh, for now bioarchive preprint. Um, 
if, if there is anyone interested in uh, uh, photosynthetic uh, metabolism, we also added in comments the capacity to simulate uh, day-night cycles, so one can model the presence of light as a, a pseudo-metabolite in comets, enabling simulation, for example, of Prochlorococcus and other cyanobacteria. Um, I have a few things, but I want to uh, leave time for questions. So I'll just conclude by showing something about what uh, the, the spatial component of comets. Uh, these are actually a little bit outdated right now. We have now, see, they're slightly different scales, but this is just illustrating by that by adding collaboration with the Kirill uh, Korolev um, in physics at BU, we are now modeling uh, diffusion in comets in a much more accurate way, including nonlinearity of diffusion because of the presence of biomass and molecules diffused through the biomass, um, and also adding um, uh, noise uh, and um, population dynamics noise in the simulations. We can recapitulate, for example, the different shapes of E. coli colonies uh, shown here in uh, microscopy images as a function of the uh, har uh, hardness of the agar. Um, and um, one of the applications of this, just to give an idea of where one of the things we're going with this, uh, these are uh, uh, devices that uh, our collaborators at Berkeley National Lab use for uh, um, growing plants. This is a little flat device called the EcoFab. Uh, where they can grow uh, plants, and these are the roots, and uh, there are microbes inoculated in this compartment, and we can take the image of the roots, simulate them in comets, seed uh, microbes in different regions. Uh, we can simulate the exudation of metabolites from the root plants and uh, simulate the abundance of different organisms around the roots, and this is uh, ongoing, but I just wanted to show you uh, one of the uh, possible applications of comets uh, using this um, spatial features and to model uh, structurally spatial uh, um, communities. Um, I will conclude just by saying, you know, I think there are a lot of exciting things happening in this field, but also a lot of open challenges and some of the things that uh, I think need to be taken by people like you and people uh, in the interface of physics and biology. In particular, I think, you know, we have genome scale models that are exciting, but also, you know, as you know, um, a lot of challenges in terms of uh, reconstructing models for new organisms. And we know how to build ecosystem level models, but it's not clear how scalable they, they will be to very large communities. So there are all these different approaches where one can use consumer resource models and have statistical approaches. Um, that can be scaled perhaps to larger ecosystems. But I think it's it's interesting to think, you know, can we really coarse grain uh, community models in a, in a more, in a continuous way and bridge gaps between these different approaches? And I think this will have very important application. Just to give you an idea, there are, I think uh, there's a lot of interest in question related to uh, climate change and the accumulation and, uh, of, uh, of carbon and whether or not for example, strategies involving microbial metabolism could help mitigate climate change by increasing the amount of carbon that is stored in soil and the oceans. Um, this is by looking at carbon use efficiency. So I think, you know, it's it's obviously a long shot, but I think it's, it's interesting to explore whether models can help understand uh, the processes that um, max that can uh, increase carbon retention in soils. Um, so I think these are some of the new interesting frontiers. And I'm going to stop here and acknowledge all our uh, funding sources and my lab and collaborators. And uh, there should be a few minutes for questions. And thanks for listening. Thanks a lot. So we have time for questions. There is one. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, one question, can you comment a bit on how much curation these models need uh, in the sense, um, let's say, not, you can't always say from a genome whether a species can grow on a certain carbon source or can do something so how much of like data collected from experiments do you need to actually predict uh, accurately predict something you using flux balance mm -hmm. analysis with 
let's say, two species or more? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Is that Martina? Yes. Hi. <laughs> so, so it's it's a question that that actually we we are we are kind of keeps us very busy now because we are very excited about trying to apply flex balance models and comets to different environments and and we hadn't done this you know for a long time we rely relied on the existing tools and I think there's great work being done the Carve Me team and um, and now what is happening with model seed and K base but we realized that this automatic reconstruction and uh, automatic gap filling are really not enough to give accurate predictions. And um, so one thing we're doing right now is, uh, and I, I think that's where you know we should be thinking is that we have a lot of phenotypic data. So for example, we have growth on different carbon sources, uh, you know, gr even just binary growth or non-growth on many different carbon sources. Uh, I think that information has not been incorporated well yet in flux balance models in, in the stomach reconstructions. And, um, but, I, but I, by, you know, what I see is that, for example, and that, you know, the other question is how do you, how do you test what, what does it mean to have a good model? Right? So for example, what I can tell you is that we can now do iteration of um, gap filling on different carbon sources and and we can basically uh, match growth non growth patterns on several carbon sources um, and what is actually surprisingly difficult is to match the non growth right so if you do gap filling and ask okay this organ should grow on acetate and arabinose and so on so you'll add reactions but it's easy to add reactions but then you'll grow on everything so now we're careful to make sure that the organ don't grow on everything and we can match reasonably well growth on, I would say, a few dozens uh, carbon sources. Uh, but I think that the, the road ahead is still tricky. Ultimately, if you ask me what I think will happen is that we'll have to do some kind of hybrid model um, going beyond flux balance. Uh, but I don't know how that will look like. Um, but I think, I think you know, I, what I want to say, because I know there is a lot of skepticism and, and questions on, on flux balance models, given the, you know, the challenge of annotation. And I want to say, I think, of course, we should be very mindful about this and very careful, but I think still reconstructing stoichiometry and trying to test and validate is still an excellent way of condensing knowledge, uh, testing what we know and what we don't know about an organism. Um, so I, I know, I don't know if that, you know, I think that partially answers your question, but I think part of this is that I think we need a lot, a lot of work when doing some of this, and um, but we also be you know, open to new hybrid models. Very good. We have time for more questions, if any. Yes. How is uh, the diffusion of uh, bacteria modeled in the special part of uh, Comet? Um. So it's we, we essentially do a, a equivalent of TDEs for uh, standard diffusion, um, except and I actually I don't have the equations here, but we take into account the nonlinearity, so the fact that diffusivity can change um, in as a function of the density, and the density can change because of the growth of bacteria, but it's essentially. PDEs of diffusion equations coupled with the with flux balance. So this obviously doesn't go to the level of individual cells, and it's still a mean field model. Um, but but um, yeah, I, I think that's that's another thing that I think would be interesting to explore in the future. There is all this you know single cell agent based models, um, and I think it would be interesting to think how the two could interface. Okay, but so does uh, I don't like does it have uh, global properties like uh, the viscosity of some strains uh, or some strains excrete uh, extra polymeric substances? Uh, does it have anything like this, or are uh, all different bacterial strains kind of similar in a sense, and only the density counts? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So we can change uh, the diffusivity that would depend potentially on the property of individual bacteria, but we haven't looked much at diversity. Um, we have not looked at extra extra solar um, matrix and um, secretion, although that, you know due you know through these processes now this is in principle possible. Um, so this is this is yeah just the tip of the iceberg of this. Um, and I think you know for example one thing also that is missing and we're starting to put in there now is chemotaxis. So we're now adding chemotaxis to see. Uh, and we can capture, for example, the, the ring uh, um, um, uh, structure uh, shown in Terry Was lab um, through a combination of comets with diffusion and, and their chemical taxes. But this is, you know, there is a long road ahead. And I agree, I think, you know, extending this to specific organisms uh, would be very interesting. Thank you very much. Any other question? Yes, there is one. Hi. Uh, actually, I, I would. I'm interested in uh, to know a little bit more about the how you solve the growing growing in all media problem. Like when you have an over capable network, which are the approach you are using for for um, including the information that now you need to non grow. In, uh, in a certain medium? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, I wish we had a good algorithm. The truth is that we don't. I know, you know, Costas Maranas and others have developed some algorithms in the past. We haven't tried those, but I think, you know, you can email me. I can point you to a couple of papers that proposed mixed integer linear programming algorithm to solve this problem. Um, what we're doing for now is basically manual loops where after adding, you know, after gap filling on one or one um, set of nutrients, we check growth on all other, other nutrients and we revisit um, the addition. And one thing we found, for example, is there, there's in surprisingly a few reactions that cause the models to grow on everything. Um, and some of them are incorrectly annotated as reversible. We send feedback to uh, model seed, and I think now the, some of this has been fixed. So the, some of this were um, issues with some of the reactions, but but so far we we do it manually. So um, I think this is still, uh, you know, I, I, there is a certainly a better way of doing this. Uh, happy to connect if you're interested in this. There is one more question. Um, hi, Daniel. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, this is Sanjay. Um, oh, hi, Sanjay. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, you know, I was very uh, uh, sort of uh, intrigued and I find it quite impressive, uh, the uh, effort to, you know, interrogate the metabolic network to see what is primitive uh, and perhaps what is the most primitive inside it. So at this point, could you, um, you know, so uh, all these metabolic networks are run by enzymes uh, today. And uh, uh, one would like to know what is possible without, um, you know, complex molecules like proteins. Uh, is, is some, can something be said uh, on that matter? And what, what might be the most uh, primitive part of the, uh, of the metabolic network that, um, uh, uh, you know, that can possibly be run without uh, large molecules like proteins, like very efficient you know, enzymes and so on, Pro maybe cofactors yes, and so yes. on. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Beautiful question. And I, so um, I think there is just amazing work being done now. For example, some of this is in uh, Joseph Moran's lab. Uh, this paper here is one of the earlier papers. I have a few more, but uh, they've been doing these experiments with uh, minerals. And they showed that, you know, starting from a few precursors, in fact, some recapitulated what we had found in the network expansion algorithm, but you can have uh, iron minerals and a few precursors, and you can generate a lot of the TCA cycle and certain carbon metabolism intermediates without any enzymes. So I think there is more and more of this non-enzymatic metabolism coming up and, and being demonstrated experimentally. 
Um, but I think this is just the beginning. I think people just had not asked these questions in the past, right? Because we're so focused on, you know, other types of questions. But I think now that people do this, we'll discover more and more on this non-enzymatic uh, metabolism. There's also this question, right, of at some point, the, the idea is that the minerals could be the early catalysts, but at some point, the molecules that are synthesized could themselves act as catalysts in this, you know, mutually catalytic networks. And, um, and I think, yeah, there, there is going to be, I bet, a lot more work in this direction in the future. But this is, I think, you know, this would be a definitely a good starting point to, to read about this. And um, I'm, I'm following this with great interest because I, I, I agree with you. I think that's, uh, that's what needs to be done. Very good. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank uh, Daniel again. Thank you, everyone. And enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So very good. So we managed to be at least 10 minutes late. So I did my job. Uh, and uh, so what we can do now is to move to the uh, two choices you have. Uh, so there is a tutorial here uh, led by Justus on uh, um, uh, environmental dependency of selection. Great, thanks. And uh, on the terrace, Wolfram will lead the discussion on, uh, on books. Okay, so what I propose to do is to uh, have uh, five minutes to sort of move around and uh, thermalize, and then uh, uh, we start the tutorial here and uh, whatever you want to do. Okay.